Uh, my name is Bradley Ball, and uh, we're here to talk about the changes within the 2014 Optimizer. Uh, so a little bit about me. Uh, chances are if uh, you've probably been in one of these webinars before, so I'll make this pretty brief. Um, currently, I'm the Data Platform Management Team Lead for Pragmatic Works. Oh, and uh, I auto-advanced. Not quite sure how that happened. Sorry about that. Almost never happens, I promise. Um, and I previously was a DBA for the U.S. Army, um, Office of the President. Uh, I SQL Balls on Twitter, blog at SQLBalls.com. My email is bball at pragmaticworks.com. Uh, these are the two books I've written in. Uh, I was the, the managing author for the 2014 SQL Administration book. Uh, so please feel free to hit me up with any questions that you have. I will get uh, a PDF of these slides and these demos posted on my website uh, at the conclusion of this. So real quick, here's our agenda. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to cover very briefly the relational engine. We're going to have a, a brief review on it. We're going to flag exactly where things did change. And my slides have a mind of their own today. Uh, we're going to talk about enabling the new Cardinality Estimator in SQL Server, uh, validating which Cardinality Estimator we're actually using. And then we're going to dive a little bit deeper into specifically what's changed. We're going to talk about the correlation assumptions for multiple predicates, ascending key and out-of-range values, uh, join, the joint estimation algorithm, uh, joint containment, and also distinct count values. We're also going to talk about a parameter for issues on how you would actually detect whether or not um, you should use one cardinality estimator over the other. Now, one of the things I want to say is that everything I learned from this and a lot of the demos that I grabbed are all from a fabulous white paper that Joe Sack did. Uh, Joe is a SQL Server MVP, lives up in Minnesota, um, used to be very active uh, uh, within the community. Uh, I think he occasionally still does some contract work for SQL Skills. Joe is a great guy. Uh, so I recommend you grabbing his white paper if this is a topic that you're interested in because Joe goes into a lot of depth uh, and he did a lot of great things to be able to show the differences. Now, Joe wrote his on the RTM version. I'm going to be using Service Pack 1 for SQL Server 2014 uh, and I also have Trace Flag 4199 enabled. We'll talk a little bit about what that is later in the, in the presentation. So first up, as a bit of a review, uh, first, in the relational query engine process, when a query enters into SQL Server, we go through a couple steps. The first one is we parse, then we bind, we optimize, and finally we execute. When we look at what changed within the query optimizer, we're looking at optimization right here. This is where the cardinality estimator changes actually came into effect for us. Let's see. I think I already have... Oh, okay. I had a quick question, but I see. Um, just so you know, uh, <laughs> um, if, if you ping me answers as we're going along or questions, I will try and do my best to answer them. I may hold until we get to uh, around the demos just to make sure that we, we have enough time. So as we're, as we're looking at parsing, the way I want you to think about parsing is think of the way that you would conjugate or, or you would diagram a sentence. Um, this is where the query optimizer actually takes the data that we've sent to it and it parses it for validity. For example, you cannot execute a table. Um, I can't select from a stored procedure unless I do some really funky things with dynamic SQL. The next step is we bind. We have name, name resolution, type derivation, aggregate binding, group binding. Um, if you've ever written a nice group by statement and then you went, oh, you know, there's one more column I really need to add to this query, uh, and you added it, but you did not add it to the group by statement. You get a nice little red, uh, you know, entry that there was an error with your query. Uh, this is so we don't waste time throwing things over to the, the query engine to compile or come up with an execution plan. Uh, we have to make sure that we actually are able to bind to tables. The table must exist. Uh, we must make sure that we're not casting the tights that, that are illegal transformations. Uh, if we have aggregates, we can actually aggregate on that. Um, and if we have groups that our groups are set up such that our queries are correct. When we break this down a little bit further and we, we get to the heart of optimization, uh, we have input trees, simplification, derived cardinality, and join orders, uh, trivial plan, and exploration. Right here, derived cardinality and join orders. This is where things specifically changed for the cardinality estimator within SQL Server. Now, to talk a little bit about what happens in this phase of optimization, deriving cardinality, we use statistics. We use them to be able to get the number of rows in a table, so the optimizer is able to guess the number of rows per table in a logical tree. Um, essentially, this is the point in time, and, and this is why statistics are very, very important, because what we're doing is we're, it would be horribly inefficient if we actually went to the storage engine and said, return to us all the data. 
tell me how many t rows are actually in this table. Uh, when we sample for statistics or we update for statistics, we can get a statistical count. We can do a high-level sample. We can do a deep-level sample. Uh, but what we're doing is we're getting that sample so the optimizer can guess whenever we have to write a query. We use this to determine our join types as well. Um, if it's a more complex query, if it's expression, um, it's really important for us to have good cardinality estimates. There are three types of joins, and we're not really going to cover joins in, in depth, the different types of joins. Um, you can have about eight different syntactical ways that you could call a join, uh, but behind the scenes, there's only three actual joins. There's a nested loop join, a merge join, and a hash join. Nested loop join. Um, is my very low lightweight one, merge join is a sorted order or an ordered one, um, and then my hash join is for my heavy lifting. If our statistics are off, we could get a join selected that's not best for us. For example, if I have millions and millions of rows in a table, for some reason I cannot see the estimates, uh, I may pick a nested loop join when I really need a big heavy lifter like my hash join. Uh, conversely, if I have a vastly anarchic accurate cardinality estimate, I may be picking hash match joins, which would be much less efficient when I can have a very simple nested loop join. The complexity of this can also push our query plans to where a query plan that could operate serial using just one CPU could be pushed to being a parallel query, um, taking up multiple CPUs and, and causing our queries to run a bit longer. There are some things, though, that make it a little more difficult for us to see query estimations. These are important things to keep in mind. Scholar functions, uh, views. Single level views, just fine. Once you get into multi-level nested views though, um, you have something called view expansion. And about three or four levels up, the query optimizer can't see the statistics in the views and it guesses, and it guesses the same thing every time one. Uh, that's horribly inefficient. We get a little bit more optimi optimal estimations on view expansion in 2014, however, it's still not great. Um, and if you've got views referencing views referencing views, that's a separate problem that we're, we're not really going to address today, but that is something that could cause you query performance issues. Table variables, table variables um, and CTAs, um, table variables do not have statistics associated with them. You can force it, but it's a one-time snapshot and it's really not that good or that efficient. Um, CTEs or common table expressions are nothing more than expanded views. Um, so if you have a CTE, CTEs are great for doing some really interesting, crazy things with queries, uh, for being able to pull together hierarchical trees. However, when you have a CTE that begins referencing itself and joining on itself over and over again, you go through the same view expansion phase, and after a while, it's just going to be guessing because it can't see those base level statistics, and it's guessing one. And, and that's never a good thing for us. Let's see. So... And just so you're aware, oh, and let me get this one go out of the way so I can actually advance my slide. This is still true. This is true from the estimator, the cardinality estimator, and the optimizer that we had from uh, SQL 2005, uh, SQL 2000, uh, SQL 7, all the way up to SQL Server 2014. This did not change. So when we look at statistics, there's a couple things that I, I would ask you to implement that will really help your systems, especially if you have a very large database. As my buddy Jason Horner likes to say, um, every database aspires to be a very large database. So as your databases get larger and larger, this is something that's going to uh, definitely help you, uh, especially as you, as you get into statistic management. First off, auto-update statistics should be on. There are a couple caveats where I would turn auto-update statistics off, uh, mainly if I'm on an old TP system that has uh, averages more than 2,000 transactions a second. If I'm using something like BizTalk, uh, where I have non-persisted uh, data, where literally the, the, I'm taking no backups and the restore operation would be drop the table and, and redeploy a schema. Um, same for a true uh, staging table for a data or a staging database for a data warehouse, where I'm not backing it up, the data is transit, I load and then I ETL out and then I truncate all the tables. Uh, I could turn my statistics off on those because I'm typically going to be doing full scans and it really doesn't matter. Uh, majority of the time, though, I want my auto-update statistics on. When auto-update statistics is on, though, the way it works is 20% of a table plus 5,000 rows must be modified in order for us to be able to get an auto-statistics update within SQL Server. This is not bad for small tables, but it's really, really bad for very large databases. Uh, 
keep in mind that filtered indexes, even though filtered index is essentially an index with a where clause where you can have a subset of data, uh, filtered indexes require the same base table updates as other non-clustered indexes in order for an auto-update statistics to fire on them. All still true. So one of the things I would recommend is using TraceFlag 2371, even on SQL Server 2014. Um, a table must have more than 25,000 rows in it for TraceFlag 2371 to be enabled. What this does is it lowers the statistical threshold for an update to fire. Um, at 100,000 rows, it lowers it to 10% of the best table, base table. Um, 1 million rows, it's 3.2%. 10 million, it's 1%. And 50 million above, it's 0.5% of the table must be updated to force an auto-update statistics to fire. All still true. Now, let's get into some of the more interesting stuff. So first up, the new cardinality estimator. So the first question is, how do you enable this? This is here in SQL Server 2014 and above. So it's in 2014, it's in 2016 as well. The database compatibility level automatically tells us by default which cardinality estimator will be used. Uh, database compatibility level is the level of rules that the optimizer uses within SQL Server. So by default, if I create a new database in SQL Server 2014 or above, um, I'm going to have 120 as the database uh, compatibility level for 2014. Uh, I want to say it's 140 uh, or 130 for 2016. Uh, they may be changing it because 13 is an unlucky number. Uh, anyway, uh, so it may be, I think it's 130 right now in the CTP, but that may be 140 by the time we get to RTM in 2016. 110 to 90 are the old cardinality estimators that are supported by SQL Server 2014. I'll show you an example of this in a minute where you would find this in your database properties and set it. Um, all of those use by default the old cardinality estimator. However, I can force the new or the old cardinality estimator by using a query trace flag. 9481 forces the old cardinality estimator to be used. 2312 forces the new cardinality estimator to be used. So the nice thing is, if you get into some query troubleshooting, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, um, and you believe that the old estimator or the new estimator would be better for you, you can add one of the query trace flags to be able to force the direction to actually see how the optimizer would work differently using the cardinality estimator. So. I'm going to hit our first demo. Before that, let's check questions real quick. Um, let's see. Uh, sorry, restate uh, Joe's white paper name. Just so you know, there's a link at the end of this. It's Joe Sack, S-A-C-K. Uh, if you Google or Bing uh, the uh, SQL Server 2014 Cardinality Estimator white paper, you should get that as your top result. Um, and again, I've, I've got a link to that at the very end of the slide deck. I'll have that up on my blog before the end of the day. Let's see, can't hear. Okay, log back in. Sorry about that. Uh, are you recommending not to use CTEs uh, from Tom? No, definitely want to make sure that everybody knows that uh, I'm not saying you can't use CTEs. CTEs are wonderful. Everything within SQL Server um, should be used and has a purpose and a reason to be used, uh, except for auto shrink. Ask Paul Randall, there's no reason to have auto shrink. He's trying to re remove it. But everything within SQL Server has a place to be used as long as it's used properly. You can use common table expressions. Uh, one of the things I would look at, though, that's not an expand that's um, in place of a common table expression. If I have a CTE that needs to join on itself a lot, uh, I'll use a derived table. And I've got another presentation I did on PragmaticWorks.com uh, called Inside the Query Optimizer, where I dive a little bit more in depth in this. So uh, Chuck and Tom, if you guys are interested in that, that recording is also already up online, and I've got those demos live on my blog uh, for under uh, Inside the Query Optimizer. So please feel free to grab those, and, and that should have that in there. Let's see. Let me go ahead and switch over to my SQL Server. So I've got my first demo here. And make sure I've got Zoom it on just in case we're going to need it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do something pretty simple. Right now, you can see that here's my version. I'm, I'm, on, uh, I'm not on any cumulative updates yet, just running Service Pack 1. Uh, and for this, we're going to be using these three, well, I'm sorry, these four databases. I've got a couple demos that will use AdventureWorks 2012, uh, 2014, um, Data Warehouse 2012, and Data Warehouse 2014. And I talked a little bit about compatibility levels. So let me show you this real quick. 
by just right clicking onto any database, going into properties, then going into options, I can see what version, uh, what the compatibility level is for my SQL Server. In this particular case, I can see here's my compatibility level. And within SQL Server 2014, I have four options. I have 90 for 2005, 100 is 2008 and 2008 R2. Um, even though there's not an R2 flag, 2008 and 2008 R2 had the same compatibility level. 2012 is 110, 2014 is 120. And again, 2016, which will be, our, our next release is gonna be 130 or 140. By default, this database is sitting at 120. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna alter the database real quick. I'm gonna set the compatibility level to 110. And again, you can always validate that. Go into the GUI. My SQL Server is having a hard time today. Sorry about that. My uh, VM crashed, and so I'm, I'm running on the box today. So we'll see how all our demos go. Hopefully, I don't get bit too hard. And you can see that right now, I'm on compatibility level uh, 110 for SQL Server 2012. I'm going to use my AdventureWorks 2012 database. And I'm going to do a pretty simple query. Oh, and it would help if I turn on my actual execution plan. And that's right up here up at the top. When I look at it, it's a pretty simple query. I'm going to hit F4 to open up my properties windows. One of the things you can see, let me do that and then zoom on this, is my cardinality estimation model version is 70. And that's the, re the reason for that is the, the cardinality estimator came about in SQL Server 7.0 um, and has been around ever since then. So if I change this a bit, I'll immediately be able to see what cardinality estimator version I'm using. I can use my trace flag. In this case, I'm going to show how I can force it. This is trace flag 2312, and I would use option query trace on 2312 to be able to force this query to use the new cardinality estimator. When I do that, you can see right here, here's my model version. It's now sitting at 120. All right. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set this compatibility level at 120. By default, if I rerun this, My estimator version will now be up to 120. But I can also force that to use the old cardinality estimator by putting on 4981. And you can see now we are back to 70. So the very important thing to understand is this is very, very flexible. Um, you can go on any cardinality estimator level that you want, and if you feel like you have an issue per query, it's pretty easy to add an option, so that way we can, we can push back and forth. So we got another couple of really interesting things. What I'm going to do, so I'm just going to run this about five times. I'm going to turn off my actual plan. I'm going to add some more data into my Fact Internet sales table, and in 2016, you're probably aware at this point in time that uh, we received the ability to uh, actually see a query as it's compiling. Uh, part of the precursor to that that we actually have in 2014 um, is we have this really nice new DMV called SysDM Exact Query Profiles. So after this runs and I get a little more data inserted into my fact internet sales table, what I'm going to do, I'm going to close this window, let's add a new one. And my goal is to then run this next query. And what I'll do is I'll run this very, very quickly. I'll have to uh, try and catch it as we're actually executing. I'm running a little bit long on this insert. But if I, I ran this right now, this is the only query that's uh, executing on my system, this insert. If I run this enough times, now oh, it's not going to pick up on an insert. And I may get a little bit by the demo gods. Looks like my disk is just writing pretty high. I think my SSD is getting close to the end of its life. Let's see if I can work around this real quick. Now, all right. 
right, I may have to come back to this for you guys. So I, I'm not going to hold us up just for this demo. After my uh, after my insert fails, we'll come back and we'll run this. But essentially, what this query does, SysDM exact query profiles, is this allows it me to be able to see the running totals that are actually calculated, the statistics and the estimates for a query plan as they're returning. Uh, for the individual more merge and sort items uh, to actually provide that information. So, again, we'll see if we can come back to that a little bit later, but we will just keep going right now. So, next up, let's talk about specifically what changed. What changed in our cardinality estimator is the correlation assumption for multiple predicates, the ascending key out of range values, uh, the joint estimation algorithm, joint containment, and distinct value count. So for the correlation assumption for multiple predicates, if no multiple column statistics existed, the old cardinality estimator assumed that there was no correlation. Um, one of one of the problems with this is the only way that you really get multi-column statistics is if you create them or if you have a non-clustered index or a um, composite clustered index that actually has multi-column statistics within that. Uh, the legacy optimizer viewed the distribution of the data contained across different col uh, columns as uncorrelated with one another. Uh, this assumption of independence often does not reflect the, um, the typical SQL Server database schema. Uh, the way they actually exist, um, or the implied correlations that actually occurred when I have multiple predicates if no multi-column uh, statistics occurred. The new cardinality estimator assumes relationships based off of the selectivity and the statistics of those individual columns. So let me show you a demo real quick. Let's see if my insert is done and we can go back to the SQL Server. All right, so we finally got our insert to finish. So that was a little bit longer than I had last time. So I'm going to run this, and hopefully we can catch this pretty quick. There we go. Okay, so here's my execution plan that, that we actually got for this query. Uh, you can see that I had a nice parallel plan, uh, clustered index scan, hash match, clustered index sorts, a bitmap, merge join parallelism, and I was able, using the SysDM exact query profiles, to be able to get the statistical counts of these things as this was occurring. Now, this is as it's running, so the thing is, if I run this again, the results are gone, and we completely lose those. So, this gives us the information of the statistics that we believe need to be returned, um, but you have to get it at runtime. So, if you're, if you're trying to troubleshoot a query and you're looking for what those statistics look like on a specific portion of the plan, this is a nice little sniper scope that we have in 2014. So, um, oh, no, that's not what I want. There we go. Uh, so, so back to our correlation assumption for multiple predicates. Uh, let's take a work using AventureWorks 2012, and as you'll remember, we've already got this uh, running in our compatibility mode, so we're going to be using the Carnell Estimator. If we use the legacy one, let's just look a little bit at how statistics are actually calculated for a multi-predicate value right here. We're going to use the person.address table, uh, and we're looking at the state province ID, city postal code, and whatnot. When we run this, I can see I get a pretty simple execution plan, and if I look at this, my actual number of rows were 194, but my estimated number of rows were 1. This is something that you get pretty common with, with the previous cardinality estimator. But let's, let's look at why we got that row number 1. First off, if we take a look at the statistics that are actually created, when we ran our query, I can see I had um, a couple values that were created right here. Oh, let's see, I wanted box. There we go. These WA statistics, so these are statistics that are created by the optimizer. In this case, they were created for postal code and also for, for city. Uh, because when we 
wrote our query with the predicate, the optimizer said, hey, here are these columns. I know nothing about these columns. Let me grab information about them uh, on a statistical basis. So let's go ahead and take a little bit closer look at our statistics. Specifically, let's look at city. What I can see is my average length of statistics, my average depth density um, is about 17. It's saying that you know, this is, this is where I believe my statistics are going to be coming from. When I take a look at my EQ rows for Burbank specifically, I have 196. Let me go find Burbank. There we go. Burbank, 196 EQ rows. Um, and then my total number of rows sampled are 1,614. I'm sorry, 19,614. If I divide my EQ rows by my table records, I get this nice little value right here, 0 0.99, uh, I'm sorry, 0 0.00993. If I do the exact same thing for state province, I look at the EQ rows that I have uh, for California, uh, and then I look at the overall table records, I get this nice little decimal, and if I do the exact same thing for my postal code, once again, I get this value. The way that the old estimator would do this is it would actually take these individual decimals, uh, divide and, and then multiply them by the overall records in the table, so that way we get a number. That number we would get is 0 0.4511, lots of numbers going right there. Uh, when we throw that in, this rounds up to one, hence one row. So what do we get if we run this exact same thing for our new cardinality estimator? Because remember, the old cardinality estimator assumed no um, correlation for multiple predicates. So how does this work? We're going to force, well actually we force the old estimator, we're just going to let the new estimator run this time. We get our execution plan, and if you want to validate it, remember, hit F4, you can see we've got 120 right there. This time, well it's not great, but it's better. It's a more optimistic approach. I've got 13.4 rows instead of 194. So how did I get those 13.4 rows? So remember, if we get all of our values the exact same way, we can get our Burbank rows, uh, we get the table records, and we compute our decimals. The way that the new estimator uses things is it takes our most selective value, in which this case was uh, postal code, and then it multiplies it by a square root of the next most valuable predicate, which was city, and then it does a square root of a square root of the next predicate, and it will continue to do that. It will take a square root of a square root of the next predicate moving up if we had multiple. Um, it then multiplies all of that against the, the table cardinality in and of itself, and we get this value, 13.4, whole lot of numbers. This is going to round up. to the 13.4692 number that we've got. So internally what's happening is that SQL Server is using its statistics and able to calculate things in a bit more of an optimistic pattern. So next up, let's talk a little bit about the ascending key at a range value issue. So this is an old issue for the legacy optimizer. Um, essentially this arises when uh, a query predicate references newly inserted data that falls outside of the range of the statistical object of the histogram. Uh, I see this in OLTP systems where we're inserting a lot of records at a very high pace. And what happens is we may have just gotten um, a histogram update uh, because we updated enough uh, of the Hey, Brad, are you there? We just lost sound. Brad? All right, guys, let me see if I can get a hold of Brad and see um, 
if I can notify him that we lost sound. So hold on just a second. Again, sorry about this, guys. I'm trying to work on getting hold of Brad to let him know that uh, we cannot hear him. So give, give us just a few minutes. All right, guys, I'm sorry. I'm still working on trying to get a hold of Brad. So give me again, just give me just a couple more minutes. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yep. Now we can. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. I, uh, not quite sure what happened. Okay. I, no problem. Where, where did I, I lose you guys at? Um, not sure. I just, <laughs> <laughs> was, was it on, was it, was I still on the slide or did you lose me back when I was doing a demo? No, you were still Personal? on the slide. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, Excellent. Yeah. So I just started the slide. I worked. <laughs> Okay. All right. I, I think I had a network issue on my side. Sorry about that, everyone. No problem. Um, all right. Here we go. Rock and roll. So the ascending key. Yeah, this fun stuff, right? Woo, ascending keys. Uh, said no one ever. Um, so the ascending key issue arises essentially on a, a busy OLTP system. Um, essentially what happens is I've been inserting a lot of data, I have a histogram that's that's for a particular range, and I've just inserted some new keys that are outside of that range. Um, and so when I fall out of this last, last step, um, it, it's very common for this to occur in, um, in OLTP-centric applications. Um, and so what happens is it's you do not get a good statistical estimate when you're looking for rows that can force a scan. One solution was to use trace flags either 2389 or, or 2390 to enable automatic generation of statistics for ascending keys. Um, this behavior was not on by default. So the nice thing is what happens is newly inserted rows have a greater value than the last um, that, that we have in 2014 what they do is you take the average amount of range of rows, you multiply them by the rows that we have, and we give an optimistic step forward saying if there are new rows that fall outside of the histogram, we estimate that this is what the value would be. Let's do a, a quick demo of that. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to create some column level statistics um, by just doing a, a quick select 
on our sales order header table. You can see here's all of our, our values that we're pulling back uh, for this particular date. If we get our statistics, we're looking specifically for this column that we just created for sales order header. And let me make sure that that's the right number. Yep, and that looks like that matches up. And so what we're going to do is we're going to come and look at this. We see here's our overall values. Here's the number of rows that we have within our table, our average density. And we're going to add 50 new rows, specifically um, expanding on this new key. So these will fall outside of our range. Oh, and I just declared I, but I didn't insert anything. So running this under the old Cardinality Estimator, you can see I got zero rows returned. Didn't even get the query. Oh, there we go. Um, I got 150 rows, my execution plan and statistics, Oh, uh, maybe I'm getting bit by 41.99. Looks like that's on. Uh, so the estimate. Oh no. Okay. Sorry. I think I got a little flustered by the network connection. My apologies. So here's my actual number of rows. My estimate number of rows you can see is one though because I fell specifically with outside of the range for this value. So now let's try the new cardinality estimator. Again, not perfect, but better. Now, why why is this better? Because I've said this a couple times, uh, a more optimistic estimation is better. Let me expand on that, because I just realized that I didn't. Back in SQL Server 2000, for those of you uh, poor folks that, that are still doing dealing with SQL Server 2000 or were still on it, um, one of the things that was very common was you would you would run a lot of queries on SQL 2000 and eventually you would get an out of memory exception error if you ran a, a query and there was not the available memory on SQL Server to be able to run it. So in SQL Server 2005 and moving forward, um, they introduced a, a new uh, query sophomore for uh, the query grant. And essentially what happens is when an execution plan is compiled based off the statistics and the size of the table and the number of rows I'm putting, pulling back, I estimate the amount of memory that I actually need from SQL Server. And so what I do is I go to the query memory grant and I go, I believe I'm going to need this much memory for my query to be able to fit in. You have specific query gateways within SQL Server and depending on what gateway you go through depends on the amount of memory you need and you can only have certain gateways active. Uh, for a very, very large query, you can only really have one, maybe two of those based off your resources active at a time. Um, you have mid-level gateways that you can have multiple concurrent queries and then smaller level gateways where you can have a lot of multiple concurrent queries. The having accurate statistics estimations allow SQL Server to say, here's the amount of memory I need. Also, if you ever had to deal with something such as a spill, a spill typically occurs because I have an estimation of the amount of data that I need to have for SQL Server and I didn't estimate high enough. And when I have a spill, um, even though on an execution plan it will say spill level one, there's I look through all the XML for execution plans, there's no spill level two or three, there's only a spill. So I, I don't know why they don't just call it a spill instead of a spill level one. But the spill falls and push it, uh, it says, I don't have enough memory for you. So it pushes things to physical disk uh, that has to be written out. It's less efficient for your query. So you want to try and avoid spills. You want to try and have more accurate memory estimation. So this isn't perfect because I didn't get 150 rows, but it's a lot better than one because my query grant is going to be higher. That means the amount of memory I'm reserving for my query is higher, which means I am less likely to be able to get a spill, which is good. So let's talk real quick. How did we get that 27.9938 number? Why, why is it better? So let's look again at our statistics for sales order header. And what we're looking at is we're looking at our all density and we're looking at our, over number, our overall number of rows sampled. 
And what we're going to do is we're going to multiply those two against one another. We get this nice big number right here, which is 27.99377 blah, blah, blah. And it's rounded up to the fourth decimal point, 27.9938. And so what we did is we said, here is specifically a range that falls outside of our overall histogram. And because it falls outside of our overall histogram, I need an estimation of how many rows should be in this. So it's a more optimistic sample. And that's one of the things that you'll find over and over again in the, in the new cardinality estimator, is that the estimation is a little more optimized. Um, let's see, so I have another question from Com. Can you make estimated number of rows to match actual number of rows or is it never matched? So, Tom, that's a great question. It does match. It, it does match quite often. The key is um, to be able to select off of a predicate that actually has very accurate statistics. Um, and then normally you want to have an index that aligns with that. For example, in, in the previous um, query that we were running, uh, we used postal code, we used state, um, and we used zip code. And what we could do is if that was a query we were running really, really often, we could put together a non-clustered index with our leading predicate being postal code because it's going to be the most efficient. Um, and then we would be more likely to get very accurate estimates on that. Um, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the best estimates possible. Typically one of the things that you want to do is, is you want to make sure that matches up with your indexes. Um, let's see. I see another question real quick. Uh, yes, so all, all of these sessions are on pragmaticworks.com. Um, this will be posted in past webinar once we finish with this one. Let's see, and let's go ahead and go back to our deck. Sorry, my go-to meeting thing keeps getting in the way of my slide deck. There we go. All right, so now let's talk about the join estimation algorithm. So. For this in particular, we've got a couple things that we need to look at. Simple joins, multiple join conditions, join equality and inequality predicates. So for multiple joins, this is one of the key areas that I want to say, um, you know, you're going to want to compare the old cardinality estimator with the new cardinality estimator. Um, there are some cases that I have found on simple joins where the old cardinality estimator is a little more efficient, but we're going to talk about the parameter for that and how we troubleshoot that in just a little while. For multiple join conditions, the old cardinality estimator assumed that the selectivity of each equality predicate had independence and then combined them. The new cardinality estimator uh, joins based off the pattern of the join columns. Essentially, in this case, we're looking for the best equality per column and we're matching off of that uh, rather than calculating them independently and recombining them. Uh, and then when we look at join uh, equality and inequality predicates, uh, the old was selective um, and it was combined essentially through multiplication. The new is one to many based on relationships actually used within those um, predicates going from large to small. This is my demo number four, so we'll do this one. So one of the things that we want to do, I, I'm going to do a pretty simple join right here. I'm just joining dim employee, um, and I'm going to do an inner join to itself. I'm going to use the old cardinality estimator and the new cardinality estimator, and what we're going to do is we're going to look at these values. And actual execution plan would help. Always remember to throw that one in there when you're playing around with this. And, and one of the things that we can see is specifically the rows and the estimates that we got back. It looks like this is pretty accurate. I'll be honest, I have not run this since Service Pack 1 with 4199 enabled. Um, so I, I want to say beforehand uh, that was a serial plan and it used to change it uh, from a parallel plan to a serial plan. But it, it looks like with some modifications, it looks like we're getting pretty much the same estimations. Oh. Yeah, so it doesn't look like we're getting a, a big difference on this one. So I, I know that I'm going to get bit by the demo gods a little bit on this one. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to grab our old cardinality estimator and our new cardinality estimator totals. Um, we're going to insert those. So for this one, I remember we had quite a skew difference. Um, 
especially when we stepped it up and we did an inner join. And again, remember, this is simple joins that we really need to watch, um, looking for a higher, higher rate of variance. So this is our old cardinality estimator. Get our actual execution plan back. Uh, on this one, we're using uh, DBO fact reseller sales. We're joining on fact currency. Um, when we pull this back, what we'll do is we'll get the actual rows and the old rows. And I'm thinking that with my machine running a little slow today, uh, this 70 million row query might actually take a couple minutes. So I've, I've got my old totals previously. Uh, and this is another case where what I wanted to make sure and illustrate was that the old cardinality estimator sometimes is a little bit better. You can see our actual number of rows were 70 million, 470,000, and 90. Our estimates under the old cardinality estimator were only about 10 off. Um, whereas using the new cardinality estimator, we were about 20 million rows off. Let's see. Let me go ahead and stop this one. Okay, this is only a couple million rows, so this may run a little bit better. So one of the things that I, I did in this one was I dropped my primary key specifically to be able to create a heap to show part of the estimation different on a simple join um, between having a multi-column predicate and not having a, a, an index to be able to provide specific statistics for this. I, I've got all these numbers that I put within these queries so that way if I had something go wrong and I couldn't run these, um, so you could get your numbers and you can validate them. Again, I'm going to put this up on my resource page for SQLBalls.com. Um, Liz, I imagine we'll also get a blog out for PragmaticWorks.com that just has a link to where they can download the deck and the demos for these. But essentially the results that I got uh, for these is my new cardinality estimator um, when I was running with a heap uh, and my old cardinality estimator running as a heap, pretty accurate. Once I added my clustered index back in, all, all of a sudden the old cardinality estimator began performing the new cardinality estimator. So remember with anything in SQL Server, we have a little bit of an it depends world whether things will be better or not. The key things that we want to see is we want to see the estimated number of rows and the actual number of rows. If we believe that a query is running less optimally, um, what we want to do is test the two cardinality estimators to be able to run back and forth on this. I, I didn't title this session a performance troubleshooting one for the cardinality estimator, but that's essentially what I want you guys to be able to get out of this, is here are all the changes, but here's how we would detect them uh, specifically to be able to change things if we need to. And I will just skip the remainder of that. Make sure that you guys have that in the demos. So the final thing that I want to talk about is join containment. The old model for join containment was essentially if an equal join contained two or more predicates, the cardinality estimator assumed there was a correlation. The new uh, way that the cardinality estimator works is based off the table's histograms. The histograms are used before applying selectivity of non-filtered joints. They actually look at the correlation between those histograms uh, to be able to assume whether or not there, there is a correlation between the two. Um, it, just to kind of illustrate this a little more, the simple containment assume, assumption assumes the following query uh, joins two tables with an equal join predicate. Um, it, it, and so that's what we're going to look at within our demo. Uh, let me get number five open. And so let's look at our actual number of rows and, and we're going to do a count again for the old cardinality estimator or the new cardinality estimator. Uh, we're on 2012. Remember, we've already updated that to use 120 compatibility mode. Throw on our actual execution plan. These should be lower rows, so all of these should return for me today. And I can see here's my actual number of rows, 12 that were returned this time, 51.5346. If you're wondering how to get those counts pretty quickly, you could just grab them out of this window. So we've got 12 rows, and then grab these right here. You can see this matches up. Now I'm going to look at my new cardinality estimator. 
I can see that my estimation was automatically a little bit more dead on. And part of the reason why is we looked at the predicate histograms and actually compared the correlation before we made our estimates for the overall numbers. When we look at our distinct count values, um, specifically the way that we're calculating those, we're going to take our actual, our new and our old. We're using AdventureWorks Data Warehouse 2014 for this. You can see that this one is a, a nice parallel plan and we're estimating that here's our actual number of rows, but we were estimating that we were going to get back a little over 27,000 rows. So let me make sure that all these numbers match up. Looks like with Service Pack 1, this got a little bit better, but not great. And now let's take a look at the new Cardinality Estimator. And it looks like we're a little bit higher on this one as well. Now, part of the reason for the distinct count is, and I found this to be very interesting, this is the reason that you want to test this, is that when I'm doing an inner join, the outer table that you're joining on, if you, um, if you have a disproportionate number of values, uh, the multiplication of that histogram is a little bit off. Um, that's, that's something I've sent over to Microsoft, but I've been able to replicate that a couple times. So this is a key area in distinct count where I, I like to look at these, um, anything where I've got multiple predicate values and where statements and a group by combined. Typically I'll find these more in data warehouses than old 2 p systems, um, but this is something to, to definitely watch because while we're definitely not going to get a spill, one thing is if, if the old cardinality estimator, if the number of rows that we return is a little bit lower than this, the overall execution plan will become serial, more likely under a car old cardinality estimator than under the new cardinality estimator. And then there's another example where you can do the exact same thing. Uh, I just added another inner join to be able to show how the outer tables continue to swell these, uh, even as the old cardinality estimators bring these numbers to a little bit more manageable level. All right, oh, and I just did distinct count. So for distinct count, queries with many-to-many -many join operators, um, a, w whenever that happens, when you have multiple many-to-many's, under the old, it amplifies the many-to-many -many join operations, the new uses an ambient cardinality. Um, Essentially what this does is it, it uses the smallest set of joins um, and then it looks by what is contained within the group by and the distinct. It, again, I've had issues with distinct count values as, as I look at those. I find the estimates aren't as improvement, are, aren't as accurate. If you're on a system with a lot of memory, that's not going to hit you really hard because it's just the memory grant and it's, it's going to reserve that so you don't get a spill. Um, again, remember the new cardinality estimator is often a more optimistic cardinality estimator. Um, it's going to err on the size of giving us more memory than giving us less. So here are the individual things. When we're, remember, when we're looking at the optimizer, this is specifically what changed. Correlation assumptions, uh, the ascending key value, uh, the join estimation algorithm, join containment, and distinct value count. So I wanted to give you a quick barometer for issues because I've flipped back and forth between these cardinality estimators a lot to be able to, to show you that it's very possible. So when would I actually say I'm good using the new cardinality estimator? First off, if there's no changes to the ex execution plan or estimates, if they're the exact same as they were on, a, on the previous cardinality estimator, then you're fine to use the new cardinality estimator. If there are changes to execution plan shape but not estimates, you're probably still fine. Um, the new estimates probably produced, had a lower costing mechanism that, that allowed us to be able to create a plan that was in a bit of a different order. Um, as long as it's changes to the execution plans but the estimates are still the same, once again, you're fine. Where you really want to start to, to look closely at things is if there's changes to the estimates but not the execution plan shape. You want to understand why the estimates are different. If you don't have any memory issues, um, and you have plenty of memory to spare, then this is pretty good. However, when this happens, if you start getting larger memory grants, and you start noticing your weight stats maybe shift to uh, um, 
to a, a page IO EX latch uh, where you're shifting more things in from memory because you're shifting out because the grant reservation is grabbing more memory than it's not necessarily needing. That's when we really want to start looking closely at that. Where we definitely want to change things is if we have changes to the estimates and changes to the execution plan shape. Um, and again, the biggest way to test that is running the query using both cardinality estimators and seeing if you're getting vastly different calculations. And I have seen plans run a lot better on 2014 on that new estimator. I have seen plans that did not run better on the new estimator. Um, one of the key things to remember is that Service Pack 1 for SQL Server 2014 enables Trace Flag 4199. If you are not familiar with Trace Flag 4199, Google it, Bing it, but essentially what it does is it turns on all of the um, optimizer fixes in previous versions of SQL Server that are not on by default when the product goes RTM. People often go, why wouldn't those fixes be on by default when the product goes RTM? And part of that is just the development cycle. If you've ever been a developer or worked in a development shop, um, you don't plan up to one release and everybody just stops and relaxes. Uh, right now, the SQL developers are hard at work at SQL Server 2016. Uh, we will probably get our last CTP sometime within the first half of, C uh, of 2016. That's just a, a spitball guess by me. It could go to mid-2016, depending on if they have any issues that they need to find. However, for the most part, they're probably code complete at this point in time. The code they're doing is probably to be able to either fix things or enable issues. And if you think about it, SQL Server 2014 through 2005 are all out there being used. 25 is, um, I think, out of extended support, but 2008, 2008 R2, 2012, there could be optimizer fixes, hot fixes, cumulative updates that get rolled out and applied that may need to go to the query as optimizer model. By default, those things might not be included in the RTM rollout. Um, and eventually they get released, and then you turn on trace flag 20, uh, 4199, and 4199 includes all those things by default. That trace flag was not immediately available in RTM SQL Server 2014, but it was made available in Service Pack 1 for SQL Server 2014. So if you have any query optimizer issues, I would encourage you to make sure you're on Service Pack 1 for 2014, enable trace flag 4199, and then begin your testing there. So remember, if there is an issue, what do you do? Query performance troubleshooting, change the cardinality estimator for the specific levels, look at your database compatibility level. Remember, if you're running at 120, you're running the new CE by default. If you're at 110 to 90, you're running the old cardinality estimator by default. And if you're running in 120 or below and you need to force the optimizer, you want to use the query trace flags to be able to use these trace flags to force your query to be used. Um, in, in to use the estimator that you wanted to use. So this is my resource page. Everybody who was asking where the decks were, the demo is going to go, sqlballs.com slash p slash resources dot html. Um, I'll talk with Liz and we'll also, I will also uh, get us a blog up on the pragmaticworks.com blog where it just says here's where you can download these things. Uh, also, we, we've got a couple classes coming up. If you're interested in this type of content, we're going to be covering this in our Minneapolis SQL Server Performance Tuning and Internals Boot Camp. Uh, myself and, and Jason Horner, goodness, stop advancing. Uh, Jason Horner, Jason's a Microsoft MVP and a Microsoft uh, Certified Master. He and I will be teaching that, um, and I believe that is the last week in September, uh, the last full week, I want to say the 21st. And it's the, the 29th, 29th through the 2nd. Oh, oh, my bad. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Twenty. Am I looking at the wrong month? Okay, the 29th through the second. Um, or the okay. 28th. Yep. The very. Yeah. There we go. The 28th. It says the 29th up here, but oh no, it doesn't. It says the 28th. Okay, I was just on the wrong week. Sorry, everybody. So the very last week of September, the 28th uh, until October the second. Um, it's going to be a week of deep dives, internals, and performance tuning. That's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, and then my fellow Pragmatic Works consultant uh, and buddy, Josh Ludeman, and I are doing Optimize All the Data at a Modern Data Warehouse at the PASS Summit. If you go into the PASS Summit, please check us out. We would love to see you there. And Liz, do, um, we have a promo code for anybody who wants to do the boot camp, right? 
Correct. Um, if you decide you want to attend this boot camp, uh, use the promo code PT Bootcamp at checkout, and you'll get twenty percent off your purchase. Nice, and uh, and that is a lot off of off of that price tag. So we would love to see you there. I, I know it's going to be a really fun week. Uh, we've got a lot of great folks in Minnesota. Uh, Jason Strait, Steve Hughes. I'm I'm talking with them about uh, dropping in, so that way we can we can hang out and have a little bit of fun that week. So. Uh, and then here's the link, like I said, to the white paper for Joe Sack, Optimizing Your Query Plans with SQL Server 2014 Carnality Estimator. Uh, this link will actually just download the white paper for you. And everyone, I thank you very much for joining us. That's, that's all, folks. Let's see. Uh, well, actually, I know we're about three minutes over, but if you want, I can try and grab a little um, question. So... Uh, no, we don't have any um, boot camps that we have specifically uh, that will be around the Ohio region. The closest we're, we're getting with the performance tuning one this year um, is is in Minnesota. However, um, my buddy Devin Knight and, and Liz can forward emails to him and she would be happy to, uh, loves to hear where you guys would like to have our training classes. So if there's any training classes you'd like to have that we don't have, please let them know where you are and let them know what you'd like to see. And uh, we are eagerly working on our 2016 schedule yep. um, right now. Yep. So Him and I are about, probably about to review that here in the next couple weeks. Um, so definitely not any firm decisions have been made, so I'll definitely pass around that subject suggestion to him. All right, let's see. And... I think we've got a list of questions. If you'll send them to me, what I'll do is I'll make sure and get a blog up uh, when we, we post the demos and everything uh, for anybody that we haven't addressed. But I don't, I don't want to keep people too late into their lunchtime. Um, thank you all for joining us.